Welcome everybody. Thank you for taking the time out of your day. We are going to run a webinar now and we're calling this Innovate Rapidly with Generative Design and On-Demand Manufacturing. Joining us today are our colleagues and our friends from Fast Radius, as well as a couple of colleagues of mine from Autodesk. Going to go over a quick agenda. It really is very short. We're going to introduce ourselves, introduce a little bit about our companies. I'm going to talk about some of the technology trends and pressures that you may be feeling in the industry. And then my colleague, Jason, is going to uh, drive you through an introduction to generative, generative design. So my name is Sean. I'm a part of the industry strategy group at Autodesk. I cover North America and we do some market development. And I will be uh, the moderator for today, for lack of better words. Joining me, as I mentioned, is my colleague, Jason. Jason is a senior technical specialist uh, specializing on general design and mechanical design and engineering. Also joining us from Fast Radius is Max Newberger. Max is a senior application and design engineer for Fast Radius. So what I like to do is I always like to start uh, and try to set a, a overall picture. I am not the technical person. I am not gonna go down into the nuts and bolts of what gender design is and how it works. That's what Jason will do. So what I wanna do is talk about what the new possible is. And I really believe that because with the tools that, that are happening out in the industry, you can achieve the new possible. Uh, historically, back before COVID, I was on airplanes a lot, having a lot of uh, meetings with customers and colleagues, and I would introduce myself and they would say, oh, you're with Autodesk, you're the AutoCAD company. And I would say, yeah, absolutely, that is true. But Autodesk is much more than that. Autodesk started disrupting and democratizing the market 39 years ago when the PC created the opportunity to move CAD off the mainframe and onto the desktop. Autodesk disrupted the design, drafting, and engineering world, and the CAD revolution began. 40 years later, we're still disrupting the market and growing like a startup. Autodesk has 10,300 employees worldwide, and we have a $3.4 billion worth of revenue in 2020. But sometimes it's easier to explain our journey in this amazing video. It sounds kind of cliche, but every time I get see that video, I, I get energized. A lot of things that are happening in the what does a chair, a robot, uh, movies, and buildings have to do with AutoCAD? For those of you that are not familiar with Autodesk, we make tools that help our customers design and make anything. We have th three distinct groups. The first one is our architectural, engineering, and construction sector. This is where building design and the infrastructure design of roads and bridges, as well as construction come together and help uh, drive the cities that we live in and the roads that we drive on and the buildings that we, uh, we go to work in. The next one is our media and entertainment division. This is where we have blockbuster movies, commercials and video games driven by 3D animation and visual effects, as well as game development. Jason and I represent our design and manufacturing business. 
when it comes to the cars you drive, the products you use, like your cell phone or the computer you're using today, and the industrial machines that make those products, this is what we're here to talk about today. I always like to start out maybe with a little bit of the dark side. So what is stopping companies from innovating? We do a lot of studies, not only for our, our customer base, but to understand where our products are going. And some of these things are pressures that you or your company are going through today. So what is stopping companies from innovating? 61% of CEOs say their biggest bottleneck to develop innovative products is engineering efficiency. So how can we get better with that? At the same time, companies are struggling due to a shortage of resources. Four out of 10 manufacturers call this shortage of skilled workers as one of their top challenges. Overaging populations also amplify this issue. So what can we do to help you with your shortage of resources? While demand for your products are increasing, there is a problem. Productivity growth in manufacturing has grown just 3% over the past 10 years. If things don't change, you're going to have a hard time keeping up with an increasing demand. This slide, I love the image. It, can, it, connotes, it shows me there's a first place, there's a second place, there's speed there. This is your competition. Uh, this is who you are competing with. Now, are you the, the, the lead manufacturer in first place? Are you the one in the second place? Do you have enough technology to keep the second place at bay or overtake your competition? So with the other three soft skills that I just mentioned, engineering efficiency, the shortage of skilled workers, as well as productivity growth, and the pressures from your competition, what are you able to do? Let's now look at what the industry tells us is important. And when I say important, I firmly believe it is important to your workforce, your processes, your products, and eventually your bottom line. I'm gonna show an example from Forbes. I read this a couple of years ago and it still sticks with me every day when I uh, have meetings and conversations. It's about mega technology trends. Now, there's nine of these here. So you, as you look at the grid, you may say, wow, that doesn't attribute to me. That one doesn't make, that one doesn't hit my business. But don't look at it at, at, at these, think about what is happening in the industry. When you look at where these, I put these white dots, it's about data. What are you doing to manage your data and the, gen, the data that you create? Artificial intelligence. How does artificial intelligence help us or hurt us in mechanical design or engineering or rolling out our products? Automation, always looked at as a four letter word, but when you start to bring some of these processes together, you are really automating that process. 3D printing or additive manufacturing, we're gonna talk about today. Uh, platforms, being able to work within the same user environment at all times to be able to share the data that you're creating. And finally, computing power. We're all on a computer right now. More, might be a desktop. More than likely, it's a laptop. So what are you able to do with computing power to make some of those soft uh, issues better? Every one of those trends, they are disruptions to your business. Now, if you're a mechanical designer or mechanical engineer or vice president of engineering, these disruptions mean different things to everybody, but I really look at it. I know it sounds cheesy, but these are opportunities, and I'm here to show you how these opportunities can help you today. So when we break down these nine trends, I'm going to start with computing power. I personally had the opportunity to go to Oak Ridge National Laboratories, and I saw this supercomputer. I, I mean, I didn't physically see it. They were talking about it, but it was on site. So unless you're doing nuclear reactors or high level uh, type of uh, activities for the government, you're not going to have access to a supercomputer. So then how can you put yourself in a position to beat your competition? This is where you have to leverage the cloud. So high performance computing enables you to increase the speed of research and reduce time to results by running in the cloud. This is really a big leveler. And the way I like to look at this is this is supercomputing for the 99% of us. So we have the ability, because we have a computer on our desktop, we have the ability to leverage this supercomputing power. So that's one of the technology trends. The second one is artificial intelligence. What does it mean? How can you use it? How can you use it to your benefit? First example I, I'm gonna show you is uh, lightning motorcycles, the fastest electric motorcycle in the world. I think it goes around 220 miles an hour. And what they wanted to do is they wanted to redesign the rear swing arm. So in a collaboration or a partnership with Autodesk, we took a look on the best way to do that. First of all, the way we used to work 
is was in CAD or is in CAD and still called CAD today, computer aided design. But what is the computer really able to do with what we've input? So the same philosophy exists where you have a person or a team, you take your design, you input the coordinates per se into, into the computer and hope it kicks back something that is, is uh, usable. The example is a limited design option of the rear swing arm. The important thing to understand is all the people that are working on the design, they have certain goals and it's about the manufacturer ability, uh, the validation of it. Can, they, can it actually be made? How much is it gonna cost? So as you get your teams together, the green team and the purple team, you can come up with a couple of different concepts and hope that your time to market is not gonna overrun or the costs are not gonna overrun while you produce that. But there's a new way of working. You still have the same person and or team, but now you can leverage machine learning, as well as artificial intelligence and the high performance computing in the cloud. And you're going to get results that are going to be, you're going to get tens, hundreds, or a thousand different iterations to help make sure that you have the best product. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples of that. So previously on this slide, I showed we had six different concepts. Now look at all the different colors and the, the volume of concepts. Now you're able to do a lot of analysis before you go into uh, production. So Jason's gonna talk more about this slide and the, and the philosophy behind this, but my goal is to let you know that you can reduce that time to market and your design to production. Remember, think about those cars because you are in a race. Finally, I like to talk about 3D printing. Historically, you know, when it was invented 25, 30 years ago, you'd go to a trade show, you'd get a little keychain, but it's much more than that. First example I'm gonna talk about is Airbus. Now it's not about printing a plane, but it's being able to start somewhere. So I'm assuming we've all been on aircrafts. You see the partitions, they might divide the galley, they might divide uh, you know, first class, uh, the restrooms, whatever it may be, but it's also a structural part of the aircraft. So Airbus wanted to do a redesign of this and they wanted to make a goal of it to be lighter. But if it's lighter, it had to be just as strong, if not stronger. So how do you do this? Um, now, you had the green team and the purple team. They can come up with the same type of designs. They can shave ounces or grams or pounds or kilos, whatever it is, off of that. But how are we really getting through that? So I'm going to show you an example of what artificial intelligence and supercomputing power allowed Airbus to do. Every dot is a different design. So you can see on the bottom axis, we have weight and displacement. So as you hover over each of the dots, you're gonna get a different design validation. And you can change it from uh, weight to force and stress to uh, displacement, and you have a different set of design rules. So this is what happens when you leverage supercomputing power as well as artificial intelligence. You let the computer aid your design and you can go now and select which candidate you want to investigate. Remember, we went from six concepts to multiple concepts. These are the concepts that Airbus wanted to evaluate. And they were able to, I think there's like eight or nine of them. And they started evaluating each of the different designs for the different needs, stress, weight, displacement, and force. The end, it's not really about the weight of the partition. It's about the business impacts and people like yourself, leaders that are forward thinking that look at these business impacts. The bottom one, how can you put a price tag on thought leadership? Another example, now this is not generative design, but it talks about 3D printing and the complexity. Historically, the more complex a product was or is, you couldn't manufacture it, or if you did, it would just be way too expensive. With added to manufacturing, we don't care. Added to manufacturing doesn't care. You can make the products as complex as you want. Here's an example of the swing arm. Jason has volunteered to take a test ride around this. I'm gonna let him do that, but really it's validated. It works and this is the, the beauty of the simulation analysis. Another one is General Motors. We can all relate in the back seat of a car is when you put in your safety belt, this is a bracket. Historically, it had eight components. After using, utilizing generative design, we reduced that to one component, 40% lighter, 20% stronger. Um, in the day and age when su supply chain has been hurting everybody for the last 18, 20 months, uh, or you know that big ship is blocking the Suez Canal, imagine what this does to a supply chain. No longer do you have to order these parts, store them, warehouse them, drive them around, put them on a ship or whatever. Now you're able to do this and create it into one component. Once again, the business impact of what they're trying to do here is save on material costs and also reduce the assembly time. The last story I want to share with you is very near and dear to my heart. It's just been released over uh, the last two months. It's about SRAM. It's a 
bicycle part manufacturer. They're headquartered in Chicago. They have brands all around the world, Rock Shocks in Colorado Springs, um, Zip Wheels in Indianapolis, for example. So here is an example of what SRAM want to do. They had a problem statement. How can generative design leverage 25 years of bicycle crank engineering knowledge to help them reimagine how to develop and manufacture the next generation of cranks? What is key to note is they're not just taking random people off the street and say, come up with a new design using generative design. This is 25 years of knowledge that they wanted to apply and say, how can we get better? How can our products get better? So we took the first example, which is their GX crank set. You can see it's a little bit of uh, translucent there. It's hollow on the backside. It's made out of carbon fiber. Nothing really, it, the design has been around forever. So we wanted to take a new, uh, two different approaches. I'm gonna show you this example created with generative design, hundreds of different candidates. And the next one, which was also created out of generative design. Now you're probably thinking, oh, you only have to go and you have to add it to manufacture these, but you don't. What's important to understand is in the generation of these cranks, they ran 20,000 calculations utilizing 170 cores in the cloud and they were getting results back within 30 minutes. These are the benefits that you can leverage through uh, generative design. Also, they're leveraging their crank design knowledge and bringing it in-house. So here's the first one, cut off of a five axis machine, kind of looks like an Academy Award, an Oscar right there. The second one was uh, created, um, sorry, added to manufacture in titanium. You can see the, the yellowing at the top and the bottom. This is a true uh, thumbprint of titanium. Now you have these two cranks at what happens to them. The top one, five axis, put on a bike, being ridden today. The bottom one printed in titanium being ridden today. And I can tell you that with authority because that bike is my bike. That Those cranks are on my bike in the garage and I'm riding hundreds of miles a month on these titanium cranks. So within like three minutes, I was able, I covered four of the trends and there's no denying how implementing this technology can address the engineering efficiency, drastically improve your productivity growth. It also shows that Generative design can be used on consumer products, automotive products, that bracket could be on anything. And this is just another example. So what I would like to do now is I'd like to introduce Max Newberger and uh, welcome Max to the stage. Max, how are you? Hey, Sean, uh, thanks so much for the introduction. Um, as Sean said, I'm Max Newberger. Um, I'm a senior design engineer at Fast Radius. I help customers uh, across the product life cycle um, using cutting edge tools to unlock previously impossible applications. Um, and for those who don't know, uh, Fast Radius is a full service manufacturing company. Um, we offer a wide variety of cutting edge additive technologies like carbon DLS, um, HP multi-jet fusion, um, FDM, SLS. Um, and, and beyond that, uh, we also have traditional manufacturing methods, CNC machining, injection molding, and cast urethane. Um, but beyond making parts, uh, we're also a leader in manufacturing technology. We're building a cloud manufacturing platform that's a first of its kind solution that's going to make manufacturing easier, more accessible, and more sustainable. Um, with all that said, uh, Sean, would you mind showing the video? Sure. At Fast Radius, we strive to make manufacturing easier, smarter, and more capable. Easier by providing a modern digital workflow end to end smarter by bringing data and insights to every step in the process, and lastly, more capable. Uh, we want every engineer to have access to the latest technologies in manufacturing at their fingertips. We've seen a wave of innovation in the broader industrial ecosystem over the last couple of years. New material types, new manufacturing techniques, new ways to interact with your design, but there's still a gap. Today's manufacturing infrastructure is rigid, wasteful, and outdated. And that leads to a product development process that is slow and painful. The innovation that we're all used to in our consumer lives has not happened in manufacturing, and it is just ripe for a software-driven disruption. And that's what Vast Radius is bringing. We're creating that experience that everybody is used to in their consumer lives and bringing it to an age-old, enormous segment of the economy that is manufacturing. Through human history, we have seen the profound impact new ways of making and moving things have had on how the world works, from the railways to the assembly lines. And now, with cloud manufacturing, we have a new way. 
to make products and move products for the world. You now have a platform where you can go and at your fingertips have access to a wide range of technologies and materials that allow you to really understand what's possible, understand the trade-offs between options, understand the cost differences between options, and with a click of a button, start production. Cloud manufacturing is making the data and insight from making things accessible to every engineer that will allow them to design new products using new technologies better, faster, more cost effectively, more sustainably. We believe it will drive incredible innovation into how products are designed, made, and moved in the world. Very cool. Drive innovation. So Jason, uh, can you come and join us, please? Hello. Hey, Jason. So maybe you can take this down and show people exactly how easy it is and how powerful it is. Make sure that uh, some of the things that I said, I am not fabricating. It would be my absolute pleasure. All right, so hello, everyone. My name is Jason Lichtman, and I'm a senior technical specialist for design and manufacturing at Autodesk. I have just under 30 minutes to wow you on what you can actually accomplish with generative design, how it works, and a whole lot more. I have an agenda to show you. So just so you can follow along and keep track of where we're gonna be headed. I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about me and then we're gonna jump into what generative design actually is. I'm gonna show you some practical customer examples and then we're gonna get into the nitty gritty, how to actually set up a generative design study and how to analyze the results. Now for any of you that might come from other software applications that might be doing some optimization, you're probably using what's called shape topology optimization, and it's very different than generative design. So we're gonna be comparing shape topology optimization to generative design, and you'll get to see what the trade-offs are between the two. I have the feeling you're gonna prefer generative design after you see the differences. And then very last, we're gonna show you how to modify results from generative design to make them more aesthetically pleasing or even more manufacturable, or really just how you wanna customize it for your own needs. So with that, let's jump into the good stuff. First, I said I'll tell you a little bit about me because I'm gonna be talking a lot today. I'm a mechanical engineer by background or mechanical engineer, if you will. I come from an undergraduate degree and a master's degree in mechanical engineering. And I spent the last 15 years in product design and development, 10 years of which I was a professional product design engineer. And so my job was always to take ideas, turn them into 3D models, work out all the little details, turn those models into prototypes and those prototypes into mass production. I have some specialties in the area or in the field, so to speak, but really for me, what it's about is trying to take those ideas and turn them into real products as quickly and easily as possible. And of course, I want those products to be incredible. So just as an example, in that fast radius video that we saw just a few moments ago, did anyone notice the end effectors on those six axis robots? Those were absolutely incredible. I've been designing end effectors for quite some time and those are probably my favorite that I've ever seen. So Max, I might have to ask you for a set of my own that I might be able to play with, we'll see. So let's get into what generative design actually is. The first thing to note is that it's a design exploration tool. It's gonna to give you lots and lots and lots of ideas for you to explore. And that's gonna be really important to how you're gonna be able to innovate and innovate rapidly. But the important thing about those results is that it's going to give you, sorry, Start again. It's gonna simultaneously give you multiple CAD ready solutions, but those solutions are based on the product performance requirements and the real world manufacturing constraints. So I'm just gonna emphasize that just a little bit here. So here's an example. We're gonna show you this in more detail in, in a little bit, but as you could see that you have a human design on the left, a 2.5 axis generative design, and that's 2.5 axis CNC machining or subtractive manufacturing. You also have three axis CNC machining, and you also have an additive result as well. And you're getting all of these results from one tool. So you can explore what the trade-offs are gonna be between those options. Now, why is all of this important? It's important because at the end of the day, my goal as a mechanical engineer and Max's goal as well, is to really strike the right balance between the performance and the cost for a given product. 
We have limited time and we have limited resources, whether those resources are people or money or time in a test lab, it could be absolutely anything. But we have limited resources to be able to get to our end product. And as a result, it really does affect what our design cycle looks like. And it also very much affects what the product is gonna end up looking like. So in this example, and you're gonna see lots of automotive examples for me because I happen to love automotive examples, but this is gonna show you three different vehicles from Toyota. And this would apply to any manufacturer, of course, but you have the Toyota Yaris in the bottom left-hand corner. That's gonna be a low cost and low performance vehicle. And then you have a Toyota Supra in the upper right-hand corner. That's gonna be higher performance and it comes with a higher cost. Might be closer to what I might wanna have in the garage, but every application is gonna be different or every use case is gonna be different. So you're gonna find that a lot of Americans or actually anyone around the world might be better fit for a Toyota Camry. That Camry has that trade-off between performance and cost and that balance between them is really the key of where that Camry sits on this curve. Well, let's go and look for a moment at how you would get one of those products by looking at a typical design cycle. And Sean talked about this just a little bit earlier, but I wanna give you a little bit more insight or detail into what that would look like. So here you could see that I have a bunch of concepts that I would come up with early in the design cycle. And then my goal is to evaluate them and to make sure that they're going to actually be manufacturable. So put it through its, put it through its paces just like Sean was doing with the SRAM crank arms. And the end result for a product could look something like the one you see on the right. And this is actually the rear swing arm from that lightning motorcycle that Sean showed. It looks like a pretty typical product, looks well-designed, but it looks pretty standard, so to speak. But with generative design, it's gonna allow you to innovate more rapidly. And the way that that works is that you're gonna get multiple solutions and not just multiple, you're gonna get more solutions than you would have come up with on your own without generative design. And you're gonna get those solutions much earlier in that design cycle. The result is that you're gonna be able to get to your production much faster and the actual part or your product is gonna be significantly improved. So you can see on the right-hand side here, we have the new swing arm and it looks drastically different from the original. It is significantly lighter weight than that original. But at the same time, I was able to get that product significantly faster. And that productivity increase is really important, especially today when we have more competition from our competitors. So this is gonna allow you to get to a better product and do so faster. And if you wanna compare the better product aspect of things, this is a really good visual of the comparison between that traditional rear swing arm versus the generatively designed and optimized swing arm on the right. So this is the kind of thing that I want you to think of for your business and how you could use it to improve your products. Now, how do we actually do this? Well, generative design is going to give you those solutions, those multiple CAD ready and manufacturable solutions, but it gives you those in a way that you can actually figure out that balance. And so what you see here on the right is a screenshot from Fusion 360 where you could see multiple solutions all on the graph and you can change what you're actually comparing. So if you wanna compare the displacement to the mass, that would be very helpful. If you wanna compare the cost to the mass, you can do that as well. So it's really taking any of the actual metadata that's part of those designs and allowing you to filter through it. And it does so on a price versus performance curve, just like you saw with the Toyota example. The other thing that's important here is that it allows you to not only look at those models qualitatively or visually, it also allows you to look at it more quantitatively. And that means that you can truly analyze things like you would in Excel, but from Fusion 360. If you do prefer Excel, you can output the results from generative design to Excel for further analysis as well. So back in the day, to do all of this, we got more brain power in the room. So someone like myself, someone like Max, and anyone else that is willing to suffer from us talking through the problem statement to try to figure out what the ideas are that could actually solve the problem. And I have to say that while this makes sense, it can get pretty expensive. And the expensive part of things 
you know, is already part of your capital expense or like your overhead actually uh, of your business, but that can add up pretty quickly, especially when we're time constrained. So what Autodesk is all about is to do things smarter. And we have the power of cloud computing at our fingertips. We utilize Amazon Web Services or AWS to give us and therefore you a nearly infinite amount of cloud computing power. And that means that you could have hundreds, if not thousands of me and Max in the room with you to help you design. Now, keep in mind, by the way, that this webinar is a collaboration between Fast Radius and Autodesk. If you would like to be able to use this technology as part of your business, of course, you can get a subscription to Fusion 360, and we'll give you more information about that at the end of this webinar. But also keep in mind that Fast Radius can help you get there as well. So if you're not ready yet to start bringing this kind of technology in-house as part of your company, you can utilize Fast Radius and Max to help you get to those end results. So how do you actually do it? Well, like what's the practical step-by-step? -step? You're gonna define the problem, you're gonna generate your results, and then you're gonna explore or analyze those results. And what does that actually look like? That's the real question of the day. So for that, I'm gonna go and share a video, and this is the only video that I'm gonna play in particular, but this video is gonna show you exactly what we're talking about. So give me just a moment here while I play this, and we're gonna talk through it just a little bit. So this is that lightning motorcycle again. The items that you're seeing showing up in green are what we call preserves. They're what are critical for your part or your product to actually function. They must be preserved in that final result. And what the swing arm is really doing is actually connecting all of those preserves together. Think of it as connecting the dots together to make the actual product. But those interfaces of those preserves are critical for it to fit and for it to function. So those are gonna be important for you to call out at the beginning of your generative design study. The other thing that's important are what we call obstacles. The obstacles or keep out zones are important because if we add material somewhere that's gonna interfere with one of those objects, clearly we're gonna have a problem. It's not actually going to function or it might not be assemblable. So you're also going to go and define those obstacles in Fusion 360. The next part of this is going to be closer to a standard finite element analysis or simulation. You're going to define what the constraints and what the loads are for your particular application. You set it up as a generative design study and watch as you see hundreds and hundreds of results show up in front of you. Those results are gonna be comparable qualitatively or quantitatively, as I mentioned earlier, which means that you can start to really see those trade-offs between weight, cost, and everything else in between. Based on all of this, you could choose which of these is the best balance for your needs in particular. But don't forget that Fusion 360 is not only a CAD tool, it is also a full manufacturing solution as well. So once you've chosen which of these designs you'd like to move forward with, you can additively manufacture it from within Fusion 360. You can also subtractively manufacture it from within Fusion 360. And there's a whole lot more you could do as well. This is really just the tip of the iceberg. And for me, this is really just a glimpse of what's actually happening within Fusion 360. So with that, let me share my screen again, and we're gonna go back to our slide deck. And I wanna introduce you with an example that we're gonna talk about and actually show you. So let's skip ahead. Here you can see, actually, let's start before that, just a moment. So here you could see a bunch of different chair examples, and all of these differ from each other in terms of the legs. And so they all have the function of having you sit on it. They have a seat, they have a little bit of a back, not much support for this particular example, but you get the idea. And the legs themselves are what are generatively designed. So when I talked earlier about idea exploration, this is a great example to be able to see as many options as possible really quickly to figure out which ones you like, which ones you don't like, which ones are manufacturable for your custom manufacturing process and a whole lot more. But idea generation is not the limitation of what you can use this for. In addition to idea generation, you can use Fusion 360's generative design to minimize the mass of the part. The lightning motorcycle swing arm is a great example of that. And you could also maximize the stiffness of a part given a mass goal. You can also use it for part consolidation. 
The GM example that Sean showed earlier is a great one. Here's another. You can take 13 components and turn it into one component. That's going to save cost on tooling, and that's also going to save cost on assembling. And as Sean mentioned, with our infrastructure throughout the global infrastructure of being able to actually get parts, being able to additively manufacture or even traditionally manufacture locally is a huge benefit. And then lastly, you can use generative design to create visually distinct shapes and geometry. So here are a couple of practical examples for you to see, and then we'll jump into our example. So this is from Briggs Automotive, and they use Fusion 360 and generative design to lightweight their 17-inch wheel. They were able to get it to be 35% lighter than the original. That's no joke. The end result is that you have a wheel that's less than five pounds. For any of you out there that might have replaced a wheel at some point in your life, I think you'd recognize that getting this to be sub five pounds is a very, very big deal. Here's another one. So this is from MJK Performance and they make accessories for Harley Davidson motorcycles. And what you're seeing here is what they call a triple clamp. And the triple clamp as shown on the right, you have different variations of it. So you can consider what would it look like if you made this on a three axis CNC machine? What would it look like if you made this on a two and a half axis CNC machine? Or really a three axis machine, but with two and a half axis tool paths to save on cost and speed up your cycle time. That's the one in the center. That's the one that they actually went with. And the one on the right is for additive manufacturing. Now, all of these are great, but the key is getting to a final result that is good. Not only good, great. And this is a good example of that. So here's their final part. And the very first comment from people who saw this was it looks prismatic. It looks parametric. It looks like a human designed it. And that is not an insult to Autodesk. That's actually a great compliment because generative design is not all about making additively manufactured parts. It is not all about making parts that look like bird bones. It's about making real parts that have aesthetic visual uniqueness to it, but also parts that are optimized. And that's really the key here as well. Here's one last example, uh, actually two more I'll show you. This is from Claudius Peters, the most traditional manufacturing I could ever imagine. They make concrete and part of their manufacturing process uses a big tray made of steel called an ETA cooler. The one on the left is 168 kilograms. That's the original. The one on the right is only 52. And we're talking about a weight savings of 69% and a cost savings down $113. So when we talk about innovating and being able to innovate rapidly, it's not again all about additive manufacturing. You can use traditional manufacturing processes to manufacture them. And this doesn't get any more traditional. We're talking about steel plates welded together. If you would like to use generative design for something a little less traditional, you can do that too. And so this is an industrial design of a chair called the Cartel or Philip Stark chair using generative design to help them design a better chair. If you would like to see more examples of how our customers are using generative design, here's just another smattering, but also on our website, you can find a whole lot more. But don't forget that just because we have a selection of our customers that are willing to shout from the mountaintops, on how they're using generative design to improve their business, we have even more that would like to keep the secret sauce of how they're innovating a secret. So not all of our customers are, of course, on our website. So with that, now let's finally get to our example. This is called the GE Jet Engine Bracket, and you might have seen this before. It's pretty famous, in fact. This is from GE or General Electric, and this was a contest that was on grabcad.com many years ago. And the goal for this was to create a bracket that's as lightweight as possible. In fact, this is what it looks like, right? The brackets on the right, the jet engine that it has to hold onto the wing of the plane is on the left. And as you can tell from this person standing there, this is an enormous and very heavy engine. So that bracket needs to be absolutely incredibly strong, but it needs to also be lightweight. And why does it need to be lightweight? Because the cost of the bracket isn't really just the initial cost. It is a lifetime cost as well. And that lifetime cost is the cost of the jet fuel that's gonna be used to actually fly that bracket around the world. 
So their goal is to lightweight that bracket. And they did that through crowdsourcing a contest. They gave everyone the boundary conditions, what it's gonna be made out of, what the minimum wall thickness is, what the manufacturing process is gonna be and all of the loads. Your job at this point, to try to design the lightest weight bracket possible. And I'll tell you, if I had access to generative design when this contest came out, I think I might have been a good, strong player in it. But sadly, I didn't. And so now we get to talk about it after the fact. So let's go and look at what this actually looks like in Fusion 360. So I'm going to pull up my Fusion 360. And here is the initial bracket. Max, I'm going to ask you to unmute if you don't mind. I have a question for you. If I'm General Electric and I come to you at Fast Radius and I ask you to help me redesign this bracket, but I'm going to handcuff your hands behind your back just a little bit here, you are not allowed to use generative design yet. What are you going to do to help me lightweight this bracket? Well, Jason, um, you know, I think the biggest thing to do would be um, with the understanding of the loads, try to take as much material out as possible. And so if you would flip this part over in the x-axis, um, I'd imagine we probably start by hollowing out some of this backside and maybe taking as much of the material off from the bottom as possible. I'm going to pause you there. Do you want to take two millimeters off? Do you want to take five millimeters off? I mean, rather leave a wall of five millimeters. Do you want to leave yeah. a two millimeter? What are you going to pick? And um, well, I think you've, you've got five in there and that's fine. And obviously the next step would be to, to test it. Um, see how it performs. Um, most likely we'll have some failures and we'll need to go from there. Um, this is actually one of the things that I hate the most about engineering when, when, it, when there's ever guessing involved. Um, it always just doesn't feel like engineering to me. And so, uh, you know, we could spend hours, months, you know, a year possibly just going back and forth, guessing a new wall thickness, another piece of the material to take away. Um, and we, may, we might never even get to the optimal solution. Um, so that, you know, taking away generative is a pretty big uh, handicap here. Yeah, I would say so. You know, it sounds to me like that process is very iterative. So you're going to have to do the same thing over and over and over again. It sounds like it could be anywhere from 10, 20, 30, or even 40 iterations before you're happy with those results. Yeah. And, and just because, you know, I think that there's this drive, many engineers, and you sort of spoke with it um, a little bit, you know, a few slides ago with your Toyota example, but you're always trying to get that peak performance um, and with, as quickly as possible. So just because you're happy with the solution doesn't mean that it's the right solution. Um, and so having the computer help you find that quote unquote right solution is it's a huge gift to engineers. Yeah, and if I were to rephrase that just slightly, I think what I heard from you is that a better solution than the one I started with is not necessarily the best solution. Is that correct? Correct, right. So, you know, to your point, we, can, we could go 40 iterations on wall thicknesses, on removing material manually, and get to a position where we pass all of the simulations that GE required. We've cut the weight, let's say, 30%. And it, it looks interesting, it's manufacturable, and that's, that's amazing. We have a great solution. However, right, you know, there could be a solution that cuts the weight even further um, or is you know, cheaper to manufacture or could be manufactured on a different machine, thereby even reducing the cost more. Um, and that could just take another four generations, another 50 generations. And as, you know, as capable as engineers are, we might never get there without the help of a, of a piece of software. So I'm going to remove those handcuffs from me now, and we're going to go and take right. a look at what this is going to look like through generative design. Right now, I have that original bracket on the screen. I'm going to go and hide that for a moment, and I'm going to show you what this might look like if you are willing to additively manufacture it. And I think this is a really interesting result, especially because you know, I think of myself as a really skilled and experienced design engineer. I know you are as well. But I could never have come up with a design like this on my own. Yeah. Um, and, and I always, you know, good luck with the surface modeling. You know, you, could, you will be here forever with the spinning wheel getting these surfaces to mesh well. I agree with you. And what's also interesting is while I might have thought at the beginning that I'm going to additively manufacture this, I might end up having other things change. And now I have to CNC machine it. And so here's another example, this one meant for CNC machining from the X or left and right direction, as well as the Y from above and from below. 
but that requires different setups in the machine. And that means extra time and labor and therefore extra cost. If I'm not willing to do that, I can actually use this example again for CNC machining from the left, the right and above, but not below. And now you could see a flat bottom meant to not need machining. And this might be slightly heavier than the option I showed a moment ago than this one, but the reality is that that trade-off might be worth it for my particular application. Yeah, and and you know, thinking about where we started, Jason, hollowing out the bottom, right? That option with the two and a half axis machining and leaving the bottom solid is almost the exact opposite of what the generative solution was, and perhaps even performing better. So it it goes to show you that you know you can you never know what you're going to end up with with uh, using these these high end I tools. Agree. So let's go and take a look at the results that we got. And not just the three that I selected to show you, but all of those results. So I switched from design over to generative design. It's its own workspace in Fusion 360. And this is where you're gonna set up your design problem. You tell Fusion 360 that these green objects are your preserves. You can model these in Fusion 360 using solid modeling, using service modeling, Heck, you can even model this in SOLIDWORKS or CATIA or NX and bring them into Fusion 360. That's perfectly fine too. Once you define them as your preserves and also your obstacles, because you want to make sure to not have material in certain places, then you set the constraints, the manufacture, the actual loads, sorry, and then you get to choose your objectives. Is my goal to minimize the mass or is my goal actually to maximize the stiffness? I get to also put in my safety factor and other criteria, and then I get to define my materials and my manufacturing options. I'm going to start with materials because it's less interesting, I'll admit. So I'll skip over here. We have a full library of additive materials, of standard materials, and even nonlinear materials as well. And you can customize those materials to your needs. And then you can go and choose your manufacturing options. We have the ability to specify a production volume, so it'll give you estimates on the pricing. And you have the ability to choose additive manufacturing, milling or subtractive manufacturing with two and a half axis, three axis, and even five axis machining. You even get to go into the nitty gritty on the tool diameter and even the head diameter for that tool. You can also use generative design for two axis cutting and even die casting as well. Once you've set these up and you let her rip, so to speak, you're gonna see hundreds of results at your fingertips. And so in just a second, you're gonna see those results. I can look at them visually or qualitatively, and I can also look at them on a graph or quantitatively. I can also filter my results from a variety of different criteria. And so it makes it really easy for me as a curator more so than a mechanical engineer in some respects, I get to choose that right balance between those trade-offs. And I can hone in on these specific results and start to look at them in more detail. And that to me is an absolutely incredible thing that you can do. So here you could see plenty of results. I can go and grab, I'll go and grab four of these at random. And then I can start to compare what they're actually gonna look like and what those specs are gonna be. Now I am running a little behind schedule and I don't wanna have you miss anything. So I'm probably gonna run about five minutes over. So just as a heads up to everyone, here you can see all of those results visually. You can see some similarities between those different designs as well as some dissimilarities based on the manufacturing or based on that material that I've selected. And to me, the fact that I can view all of these is absolutely incredible. Again, idea generation at its finest. Once you are done with your exploration and you download a result, Max, are you expecting it to be easy or difficult to modify or tweak those designs? Well, um, I think intuitively, I would say it would be difficult. Um, and having dealt with um, other software packages that do topology optimization um, or similar you know, engineering analyses, it's very rigid. You get the model from the software and you might as well get ready to, you know, it, it, it could be might as well impossible to edit the, the model. I think um, what you're saying, Max, is that you get those results and then you have to rebuild the model from scratch? Well, you know, it's sort of your choice, right? Do you, do you rebuild the model from scratch or do you maybe just use that output as, you know, um, it's, let's say uh, your idea generation and, and then just try to match it as closely as possible? 
Um, but either way, you're, if you need to make an adjustment, you're sort of locked out. Well, I'll tell you in Fusion 360, that is not going to be the case. Fusion 360 allows you to download your generative design results as a fully editable and parametric outcome. At the very bottom of my screen here, I can actually see my timeline or my feature tree, as some of you might call it. And I can see this purple icon here. This is what we call a form feature. And this is gonna allow me to subdivide this very organic surface and come in here and select an area that I wanna edit. And I can actually come in here and push and pull on that surface to really tweak what it looks like. I can do this to add material. I can also do this to soften curves or even smooth them out and a whole lot more. And when I hit finish, it's gonna convert this back into a solid body that I can use for pretty much anything you could imagine. And if you are gonna be additively manufacturing a part like this and you have critical tolerances, you might want to add some material that you can machine away or bore out to be able to get your perfect tolerances. So for an area like this, where I have these two ring shapes, I might wanna use the press pull command here and set this to maybe nine millimeters instead of 9.5 something something millimeters. And then I have just a little bit more meat on the bone that I could bore out or ream out after I additively manufacture this. So the key here is that not only are you able to get incredible results, you're also able to download and edit those results before you go and manufacture it. So with that, we have two more sections left. I'm gonna be pretty quick on this, more so than I was planning, that's okay. And let's jump right into it. So the first one is for any of you that are out there that are already doing shape topology optimization and have heard of generative design but don't really know what the difference is, let me tell you. Shape topology optimization is all about taking a final part design and removing material, never adding always removing, and it's not typically manufacturing aware. So you're gonna get something like an STL file that's pretty much a color map of where the stresses are the most critical, and you could remove everything besides that. But you're the one who has to do the removal, and that could be pretty time consuming, like Max was saying earlier. But with generative design, it's a little bit of a different process. By setting up those preserves and the obstacles, you're really distilling that problem down into its most basic form. And generative design can not only remove material, it can also add material. And I'll tell you, if I can add just a little material here to remove a whole lot of material there, that is very much worth it. But not only does it do that, it also is manufacturing aware. So you're gonna get different results for each manufacturing option that you select. And you get to really evaluate the trade-offs between those options because you're getting multiple solutions instead of just one. If you'd like a visual, on the left, we have the shape topology optimization, that final part. In this case, it's a cantilever beam. And on the right, we have the preserves for a bracket. And you can see that on the left, we're turning it into voxels. And then we're going to do a stress map. And based on that, we're going to remove the material. But on the right, you can see that we have a single body that's actually spreading that load to be able to reduce the stresses and the strains in your part to provide strength and give you a much better optimal result. So overall, I'll have to tell you that if you've heard the buzzword generative design elsewhere, it may not actually be generative design. It may be shape topology optimization, so you might need to do a little bit of homework. Generative design by Autodesk is by far the best option that's out there. It is a game changer in what it can do and how it actually does it. So please do your research. Lastly, last topic here for me is how can you actually take those results and modify it even further than I showed you? So here's an example of a shelf. I have a traditional bracket made of sheet metal and now you can see one made using generative design. If we look at it from the side though, what I'm gonna be able to pick out from this is that I have the thicker areas that are the dominant load paths. I have the medium thickness areas that are the subdominant load paths. And then finally, I have these thin areas that we call recessive load paths. Based on that, you can then go in and tweak your designs. You can modify the original data using the sculpt or form modeling that I showed you earlier, or you can do what Max was talking about earlier, and you could rebuild from scratch using solid modeling, surface modeling, direct editing, or even sculpt or form modeling. So if you look at that bracket example one final time here, you're gonna see that you have the output from generative design on the left, 
you have a modified version using the sculpt tools just to the right of it. And then the last two on the right are completely rebuilt. One with solid modeling in mind, and then the last one on the right with sheet metal modeling. And the interesting thing, in my opinion, about the sheet metal example is that sheet metal isn't even a manufacturing option in generative design today. So what I wanna really drive home here is that the results you get are going to be usable as is for the manufacturing options that we've laid out and are available. But you can also use different manufacturing options for other manufacturing processes that you might not have even considered. And that to me really opens up the doors for a lot of possibilities. When you look at this in action, by the way, and here's a wheelchair by a company called Will, and the orange component, which is the main structure through this design, needed to be lighter weight so that a single person can take this wheelchair in and out of the back of a trunk. And using generative design, they were able to do exactly that and also give them aesthetics that are incredibly unique and draw attention to this incredible product. And if you look at the original output from generative design, you can see it on the left. There's a little bit of wearable wobble, I'll call it, in that design. But using the form or sculpt tools in Fusion 360, you can clean up that model and make an absolutely beautiful, smooth, organic form like you see on the right. And there's a whole lot more coming to generative design in Fusion 360 as well. Here's a quick little taste. Coming soon, fluids generative design fluid flow to be able to optimize an input and an output and what's in between, that fluid flow path. This is not available today and today, what's the date? July, uh, August 17th, 2021, but this is coming so shortly. And I think that this alongside what we've already shown you is gonna completely transform your business. So with that, thank you so much. I'm gonna hand it right back over to, to Sean. Right on, Jason, man. I always learn more when I listen to you talk. I've been doing this a long time, but I've learned a lot. So we are not going to be five minutes late. And the reason why Jason is five minutes late is because I went five minutes long. So I love the simplicity of the challenge. And I quote from the bracket challenge description. All aircraft engines require the use of efficient and cost-effective brackets. Additive manufacturing creates opportunities to build unique and highly efficient bracket-like structures. And here's an opportunity to show your best design. Is that aerospace or is it just a bracket? If a competition can be based around a bracket, what can you do with generative design and additive manufacturing? These are a lot of the soft skills pressures you encounter and what is stopping your companies from innovating. At the same time, companies are struggling with the shortage of resources. Productivity growth has grown just over 3% over the past 10 years in the competition that you have. So we covered a tremendous amount of content and stories today. I wanna to make sure that you can find this information easy. Please go to the chat window and copy all of the links and read at your own pace. Sheila, can you please share the info to our attendees? So she's gonna drop these into the chat window. All you have to do is go over there and hit highlight, copy, and put them on your clipboard or a note. And you can follow a lot of the stories that we discussed today and learn more about Fast Radius. So if you're thinking about starting a project that leverages generative design, reach out to Max and his team at Fast Radius. The contact is in the chat window. They have ex extensive experience with Fusion 360, the design for manufacturing experience needed to make your projects possible, and the world-class industrial grade additive manufacturing factories. The team at Autodesk is also ready to help you on your journey. You can start with a 30-day trial of Fusion 360 with generative design. I would also like to introduce you to the Autodesk Generative Design Field Lab. Five years ago, I had a vision of opening a lab in the Midwest. Autodesk is a tier two member and we have 1000 square foot of advanced manufacturing workshop at MXD. As members of MXD, this is where we met our friends at Fast Radius. Information on this article is also in the chat window. So <clears throat> I hope with the heightened awareness of all the disruptions, opportunities, and the new technology, you will be able to drive your own digital transformation to define and accelerate your business strategy. And imagine the new possible. We like to close with this slide. This, this recording will uh, have legs around the world. So if you want to learn even more, you can find that information right here. I want to thank everybody for taking the time to join us. We really appreciate it. And you have the way to reach us. Thank you for your time.